Hi, this is Matthew Jude from This Game Is Broken. Look, if your game's broken, then I think you might be in the right place because the board game mechanics will fix you right up. I mean, I, I don't know if we're allowed to use the phrase Greeks monkey anymore, but I would certainly suggest some kind of hyper-intelligent baboon. Everybody, it's uh, it's March, I guess now, right? Um, man, we keep marching right through these top ten games of all time lists. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, yeah. we're done with that now, aren't we? Uh, we're the board game mechanics. I'm Joel. With me, as always, per the usual, is hey guys, what's going on? It is Jason. Jason, I don't know if I have any zany banter to throw up top here. Uh, yeah, I've been having some uh, some dental issues, so. It's, yeah, I'm not super zany right now either, so. I don't remember how to record normal episodes, and I think I talked a little about that last week, but I don't know. I think we'll be fine. I think it might be a good chance to reinvent ourselves. Um, If I remember right, you were kind of wackadoo. People wondered if you were drunk sometimes, and I played it pretty straight and would keep keep you on track. So I think with that, we better get to the news, right? Yep, that's how I remember it too. Let's go. All right, so I found a couple things on Kickstarter that I thought looked interesting or, you know, that I at least wanted to talk about. And the first one that I wanted to mention is called Throw Throw Burrito, and it's by the company that did Exploding Kittens. And essentially what you're doing in this game is you are collecting sets of cards, but the trick here is you're trying to collect sets of cards while people are throwing these little squishy burritos at you. So you're trying to play dodgeball to these burritos while trying to collect sets of cards to score a pile of points. It's crazy. It's it's from the guys who make Exploding Kittens. So, I mean, you should not be surprised that it's going to be a nutso game. But it seemed interesting. And throwing a burrito at somebody was pretty funny. So, figured I'd mention it. That does sound pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The burritos have smiley faces, too, which is cute. But... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I, like that, I'm on a strict, I'm only buying 10 board games kind of thing. And I don't know that this one's going to crack that. But it's it's if it's your thing, go for it. It seems kind of cool. It has 27,000 backers. It's raised $1.3 million, and it still has 22 days to go. I'm sure it'll be a huge one if it's about the exploding kittens people, like, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, so that was the silly one. The next one's just something that I thought was interesting, and it is called Blankenberg Playing Cards. And the only reason I want to mention this is because the designer of the Axe and the builders of Blankenberg are putting these playing cards out. It's just a deck of playing cards. The suits are each different medieval theme. So I think the clubs are like thieves and the shady underworld. The diamonds are the the rich nobles. Just playing cards. But I wanted to talk about it because I really like the des- the designer. The company Cobblestone Games is cool. Builders of Blankenberg is a great game, and I think the theme's kind of interesting. So if you want a new set of playing cards, go check it out. They're like nine bucks. It's not gonna break the bank. So Blankenberg playing cards. And that is the two things, well, those are the two things that I thought were interesting. So I don't know if you want to mention anything or not, or we can move on. That's not what I thought it was going to be. I was hoping it would be like a little chime, because I was going to do a nobles counter this episode. (laughs) There we go. There's my nobles counter. Uh, One. (laughs) One for the nobles counter so far. Um, Yep. uh, No, I, I, uh, (laughs) that's, boy, this is going to be a fun transition. Um, Just on a way more serious note. Um, people are involved in this industry and, uh, we've been really lucky that the people at Japan Anime games have been really cool to us at the board game mechanics. Um, they've been a really good partner for us with doing some review stuff with them. And, um, they put out a bunch of games that I think we really like on the show. Um, anyway, they had one of theirs, uh, pass away, uh, Rich Gain, um, who I think was instrumental in growing that company, um, lost his, uh, wife and son. So, um, just something to think about, guys. Um, I, I don't know what we can do as a community to support him, but um, just, man, there's all kinds of people out there that are behind these games and involved with these games. And I know there is a GoFundMe campaign um, to, to you know, deal with the costs associated with, you know, when you lose somebody like that. So, um, and Japan Anime Games uh, and Rich Game, we feel you guys here at the Board Game Mechanics and your loss. And we, uh, you're in our thoughts and our, our, our prayers for what that's worth for you guys. So, uh, that's it. Um, that was pretty somber. Uh, can we get back to like the nobles counter or something? I don't know. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, nobles, nobles. All right, <laughs> <laughs> two more, three. <laughs> All right, yeah. So uh, yeah, I totally agree. That's super sad, and Japan anime is really awesome. So if you feel compelled. Go help out Rich in his time of need. We don't say that lightly. Japan Anime is one of our favorite partners here at Board Game Mechanics, and their games are all really cool. So, um, for sure. shout, yeah. shout out to them for sure, too. All right. So, looks like this week we're going back to each talking about two games we played. That's a little old school. So, we're reinventing ourselves by doing the same thing we used to do. I mean, that seems pretty cool. Um, so my first game is a game from Deep Aqua Games, and it's about running a little tea house and fulfilling these customers' con- um, orders of tea, and the game is called Chai. So what this is, is it is a game where you're collecting different tea ingredients, flavorings, um, fruits, whatever you need to put in a tea, and you're trying to give them to certain customers to fulfill their order so you can score a pile of points. It's uh, you're going to take one of three actions on your turn. You're going to either get some kind of ingredient. You're going to reserve some guests that so only you can fulfill their order. And then at the end of each action, you can fulfill an order if you have the correct ingredients. It's super quick. It plays over five rounds. It has gorgeous art, nice components. It's really easy to teach and it plays. uh, It's probably a nice gateway family game. And if you want to know more about it, there's a video of it on our YouTube channel that I just did, I think last week. So you can see a little bit of the playthrough, and I'll give you some thoughts on it. So that is chai. So, Jason, who drinks chai? I have no idea. Nobles. <laughs> I should have. I should have realized that answer. Yeah. Um, I I have not played this one, and it was <laughs> it was kind of buzzed. They did a good job marketing it on their Kickstarter. Um, so you you feel like it's a rock solid game, huh? Yeah, it's good. It I like, it's a definitely a good gateway game, and I had a great time. I played it two or three times, and it was awesome every time. I think we're starting to develop our little isms, like Jason isms. Like pile of points is a Jason ism for sure, and obviously nobles. Um, <laughs> but but uh, the other one is I always say rock solid. So that's rock solid, huh? Uh, um, yeah, it is. That's it's rock solid. That's a buzz phrase in the world of education. <laughs> so. Uh, I played Azul, so I mean, like my buddy Jed gets talked about a lot on here, and he's never been on. I like, I should have him do a like one minute guest spot sometime. I don't know, just because he's a strange guy, and it would be fun to have him on here. Um, <laughs> it would be, it would be fun. <laughs> he he, uh, like I tell him board games are good, and he's like, mm, yeah. Um, well, I mean, whatever. We'll play some games, and then he reads like a stupid Kotaku article or something about the year's best board games, and Azul made the list. So we we play Azul and. So this is how the dude's weird, too. He's an engineer. His brain just works differently than mine. He scores 125 points on his first play of Azul. I'm like, what Dang. The heck? <laughs> yeah, he, he laps the board. And then <sighs> I beat him the second time. But um, I don't know. He really enjoyed it. And he like was ready to play the third time. And I was like, I, I think I'm okay with that. I, I just wanted to kind of just report. It does hold up. It's not great. I mean, it's, it's never been a great game to me. It's never been like a top 10 kind of game for me. But for it being an abstract kind of just tile placement game and kind of drafting or you, I pick and scoot things to the middle kind of game, it's it's perfectly good. It holds up. I, I and I would say I like it better than Rafe, um, which I, it gets compared to because of the same company, kind of same series. Um, but Azul definitely holds up a year later. For sure, yeah, I like that game. I wouldn't mind trying it again. All right, cool. Uh, the next game I wanted to talk about is a game from Doctor Finn's Games, and it will be coming out here shortly i think at the end of march or something like that and it's called cosmic run mining colony so this is in the same series as some of his other cosmic run games hence the name cosmic run but what make this what makes this one a little different is it's a one or two player game only so you can play it solo trying to beat the bot or you can play it with the one player opponent and what it is is you're gonna you have 10 cards in your hand one two one through ten and on your turn, you're going to flip a card. You're going to pick one of your cards, and you're going to flip it. High card gets to gets first dibs from these two spaces on the board. And what these spaces have, they have astronauts, they have spaceships, they have different colored gems, and they have different terrain that you're trying to put on your board, kind of like patchwork style. You're trying to get certain types, certain colors of ships and astronauts 
within a certain distance apart without anything being in the middle of them. So you can build an outpost and you're trying to get certain colored gems the same distance apart, depending on player count. So you can build a science station. You're going to lose points if you can't fill in your whole board. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game in a multiplayer game is the winner. In a solo game, there are like three different ways you can win. And if you like games like every Uwe game in the last five years where you play the Tetris stuff, or you like some um, simultaneous selection, drafting type stuff, I definitely say you should check this one out because it's it was fun to play. And I played it probably five or six times solo and still had a great time. So that was Cosmic Run Mining Colony. Also, have a video of that up on on YouTube. You can go check that out if you want to know more about it. Doctor Finn Games is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, they man, they're another great partner for us too, um, and their games are really different. You know, I feel like their games to me, um, they don't follow anyone. You know what I mean? Like they do their own thing. They're kind of their unique little niche, and all their stuff's just a little different and cool. They have unique themes and unique art, and just I don't know. They feel like they're their own thing out there, which it's hard to say about board game companies right now. So. Yep. I agree. That's pretty cool then. I played a game, Jason, that um, I think would pretty easily be overlooked because it's that kind of game that you buy like at a gift shop at a national park. <laughs> and they definitely sell it at gift parks at national parks, um, gift shops at national parks. Um, and this game is called Trekking the National Parks. And it's by Underdog Games. Um, a second edition came out maybe not that long ago. Um, this is one that I'm going to go ahead and do a review up this, get a, get a review up this weekend of it because it's just worth me getting a review up for. Um, it's, it's a really good game. Um, right off the bat. So if you're hearing this, you got to have your review on the YouTube channel spoiled because I'm gonna tell you right now, it's very good. Um, and here's why it's, it's a gateway game. It's super light. It's nothing complex, nothing complicated, but it's going to be, um, really interesting to a certain group of people so like it has really beautiful pictures of national parks in it it has a a map where like almost every i think literally every national park as of the time of the publishing of this game was mapped on it and most of them are things that you can interact with in the game and then um little little flavor text about all these parks that you can go to and it's it's kind of like it's going to draw comparisons to ticket to ride because it definitely has that like that card collection rummy kind of thing like set collection, trying to get certain cards in certain spots. Um, so it's definitely going to draw comparisons to Ticket to Ride. It also has the on your turn pick an action from this list of actions that you can do. But it's got some interesting things on there that aren't present in Ticket to Ride. Like the cards have numbers on them as well. And you can have multi-use for the cards. So you can use them to move or as the set collection thing. And then you also can block each other by being in paths that you need to go or keep people out of parks by blocking them. And then you also kind of have a choice that for one action point, you can go a ton of cards worth of movement. You could move 10, 10 movement by playing down three cards or something. Or you could say, you know what? I'm going to use three action points and go real slow on this track and collect these rocks along the way. And then there's like this like majority type thing on these rocks as well as you know trying to collect these cards. So there's, it's kind of like a point salad gateway game almost. It's got just a ton of ways that you can score points. Very light, just very easy game. Uh, but I've played it, and every group I played it with was like, man, that's a really good game. And I agree, too. Um, the component centers are amazing, too. So in an era where components and board games are becoming cheapened and smaller and not as nice, this game has some of the highest quality cards I've ever played with. Like, they're so glossy and nice that they're almost slippery and hard to shuffle. And then the wooden components in it are huge. Like, they look like children's toys. Like, they're just like these massive wooden blocks of, like, or not blocks, but like tents, and this massive wooden hiker the first player markers is really cool looking bear. Um, the board's huge, all in thick, good cardboard. Um, and it comes with this like leather, faux leather bag to store the marbles in. And there's really no reason for that. I mean, like it really, there's really honestly no reason for that bag because you're just going to distribute the marbles onto the board at the beginning of the game. Um, but I mean, they just went over the top with components on it. Um, and it's just a cool little game that's out there, independently published. Usually these independently published games that look like Ticket to Ride are really bad Ticket to Ride ripoffs. Like I'm thinking of one of the first games I ever reviewed on like a, a like, hey, let me send you a game kind of review. And it was exactly a Ticket to Ride ripoff, but with airplanes. And this one, it has flavors of Ticket to Ride, but it's definitely very different from it. Very cool. Um, I'm excited about this one. It's called Trekking the National Parks, and I think you guys should check it out. Yeah, this does seem kind of interesting. I I wouldn't mind playing it. I, it seems more interesting to me than Ticket to Ride, so maybe someday. Yeah, I think it's got more more to it than Ticket to Ride for sure. And this might be a next step after a Ticket to Ride thing. But like 
the theme really works. It's like, hey, you're hiking and you're stopping at these parks along the way, you know? Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's kind of neat. Um, and it's something that, like, I don't know, I definitely saw it at, at the gift shop and it's like, it looks like U.S. Parks Opoly or something, but it's way more to it than that. So, a very cool little, little game, uh, trekking the national parks. Cool. Yeah, I look forward to the review. So, Jason, um, I don't know how your chi is, but mine needs to to vent some negative stuff. I've got a actually. I think what really happened is we we did our top 100 games right through Festivus, and we never got to air our grievances. So, I think we need to air grievances. So, I don't know. I I think we'll just call this uh, top three things in board gaming that we're just kind of over. You know, um, does that make sense? Yeah, like that's what I was kind of thinking. Like things that I just, if they went away tomorrow, I wouldn't care or miss them. Right, for sure. Like these things can just die off, and I would be fine. Um, I'll I'll start off, Jason. Um, this is kind of what I had hinted at earlier. I think as board gamers, we get competitive about how cool we are about the board games we play. It's like it's like a meta game of the board gaming community. Like, oh, you're still playing Istanbul. Well, clearly y- Yokohama is the better game, you know, and like maybe it is. Maybe Yokohama is a better game. Yokohama is an awesome game, honestly. But like let people play Istanbul and enjoy it. Like so I'm calling this game shaming. Like I feel like we are all about like getting to that newest game and like being like, oh, I'm competitive with how on top of the world of board games I am. I don't know. Like it's fine to play older games and enjoy them. Like I have I have like one of the more recent games I've acquired is is Settlers of Catan. I picked one up on Black Friday. Um, because like that's an old game and I missed it and I'm gonna play it again. So don't shame my game. Like if I want to play that game, let me do it. And like if somebody else wants to play Cards Against Humanity or whatever, fine. I get it's not for everybody. If somebody wants to play Munchkin, Jason, let them. I know it's not for you, but just let them. Let's not shame each other's games. Um, so that's my thing is game shaming. Just like let people enjoy each other's games. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I'm guilty of that sometimes too. Like there are some games like I can't believe you're playing that, but. Again, I want to play Rococo, and not everybody wants to play Rococo. So I get it. Yeah, I I need to do a better job of just, you play your game, I'll play my game, and we'll both have fun. Yep, for sure. All right, so my first thing that I wouldn't miss, or if it goes away tomorrow, is going to be kind of strange, but hopefully I can explain it. And that is reviewers. Board, board game uh, reviewers. Not... Jason, I, I know. You, you know, Jason, <laughs> we review games. I, I know, but he, hear me out. So... Basically, what I mean is the sheer volume of reviewers. There are, you can look at at 42 different videos of the same game and get 42 different opinions on the game. So sometimes I feel like we have too much information, too much knowledge about the game where we can't even form our own opinions. So I guess my thing that I want to see is maybe more, I don't know, people making up their own minds without always having to turn to a reviewer to see what their opinions are on a game. Like do the research yourself, find it out. If you want to look at a review for just some guidance to see what components look like, fine, but don't rely everything that you think about a game on the opinions of Tom Vassell or the opinions of Rado. Sometimes you got to form those opinions yourself. And so that's kind of a weird pick, but I think that we would still be okay in the hobby, even without reviewers. I, I, I get what you're saying 100%. And like, I will add my two cents on this. I've learned this. I don't know if you're new. If you're newer to the board gaming world, you may not know this yet. But I think those of us who have been around for a while um, have figured out like certain reviewers like me, I don't review games I don't like. Like, I just, I don't tend to review games that I'm not going to give a positive review to. Um, I mean, like, there's times where I've been asked to review a game. And the way how I say a game's not very good is I'll say, this game's for these people and not for me necessarily. Um, just because I don't want to come straight out. Like somebody like loved that game and did the best they could to try and make an awesome game. And I'm sure there are people who love that game, but it wasn't for me. So like, if I say something's not for me, that means like, I really didn't like it. And the other thing too, is if I don't review it, like I didn't like it and I'm not going to do it because I just, I don't know. I, I don't, it's cheap to be like, this is trash. I'm going to throw it off my roof. Um, like I just, I don't know. Like I'm not going to spend my time. The other thing too, is I only do so many reviews a year. I'm not going to put out a review just bashing something when I would rather spend that time talking about why something's awesome. And it's so much more interesting to watch someone who's passionate about something and really loves it. So I'm with you. Like there's just way, way too much of a hive mind that follows just certain reviewers. Like that's for sure something that's out there. Um, Like there's just certain games that I'm like, man, I love this game. And then even I like, I know I love the game. 
And then I'll watch like Quinn's go, that's ah, okay. And I go, oh man, why do I have to just think this game's okay now? And then I'm like, wait, you're stupid. Like, like the game. Who cares if Shut Up and Sit Down didn't like it? Or like Vassal will be like, hey, this game wasn't for me. And I'll be like, you know what? Feudum's awesome. So forget you. So I don't know. Like, um, yeah. I definitely get caught up in it too. So I mean, like, but I'm with you, Jason. I think we give reviewers too much credence. We should figure out what we like our own on our own. Maybe have a few more voices out there. Or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I follow you, though. Like, the whole review culture is kind of weird. Yeah, I'm not saying people need to stop reviewing games. I'm just saying I think people need to not rely strictly on reviews for information. Yeah, except for the- do not ever buy <laughs> Gear World The Borderlands. That game is terrible. <laughs> and they should always listen to our channel, The Board Game Mechanics, because we're awesome. I mean, like... <laughs> yeah, if your name's like Scott, Mike, or Richard, probably like you seem to match us pretty well. But uh, <laughs> there's others too, I guess. But uh, yep, those are that's a that's a secret shout out to fan one, two, and three right there. <laughs> uh, you guys can fight over what order you are. Um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to my next one, Jason, and I think you might be able to chime in on this. Um, I'm pretty over Kickstarter, and by that I mean like Kickstarter abuse, I guess. Like, there's two things that happen on Kickstarter that I'm just like, why are we letting this continue to happen? is like this fear of missing out thing that people would capitalize on. Like, hey, spend an extra $15 on this one because if you don't buy it, you're never going to get meeples with hats on them and you're going to be stuck with meeples without hats. So you know you don't want to miss out on special hat meeples. Extra $15. And so people do it, like and myself included. I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't want to miss out on plastic dinosaurs with hats. So I'm going to definitely spend the extra money on that. And then, and then, like, so they capitalize on this fear of missing out thing. And then the other thing that really bugs me about Kickstarter is the fact that, like, well-established companies who have no need for Kickstarter at all are using it as a generation and buzz tool to, like, capitalize on that fear of missing out. So you say that this thing's a limited edition only on Kickstarter. Get, like, extra premium amount of money. Sell games above MSRP plus a big shipping cost. Then beyond that, like, this is the one that really makes me mad is when I buy a game for full MSRP plus a shipping cost for Kickstarter exclusives. And I look on Cool Stuff Inc. or Card House or something, and two days before my copy arrives, I can buy it retail for 10 bucks less, free shipping, with all the stuff that was Cody Fingers here. I know we're not in the visual medium. Kickstarter exclusive. Like, that grates on me. It's like, yeah, that was real Kickstarter exclusive, that you're selling your Kickstarter exclusive edition on retail, like websites, fulfilling it before you fulfilled it to your backers for 10 bucks cheaper. Like, that really grates on me. So that's the Kickstarter stuff that can go away. The Kickstarter stuff where people have good ideas and they haven't been able to get published and they want to see if the people want to help them get published and help establish a new company and that entrepreneurial stuff, that's awesome. I love that. But, like, I'm looking at you, Queen Games. Like, you really honestly need to do another Kickstarter for, like, Thebes 5th edition? I mean, like, honestly, why? Like, if you guys haven't been able to figure out how to fund your own printings of games... That's pretty ridiculous. And like, I get it. You're using it for pre-sales. It's not really a, I need to kickstart this thing, even though the name of the website is Kickstarter, not kick continuing, kick pre-sales. But anyway, whatever. That's my rant about Kickstarter. I'm sure you can add to that, Jason. Yeah. My next item was Kickstarter as well. And yeah, like, like you mentioned, the companies who are using it as pre-orders or, you know, they already have the games published. They just want to use that instead of their own website or whatever. Like I just saw that Simon C- is taking Lorenzo El Magnifico and putting it back on Kickstarter. I don't know why. I don't know for what the game doesn't need to go to Kickstarter. Just publish the game. It's super popular on the top 100. People are going to buy it. Like I don't, right. I don't understand. It doesn't need to be deluxified. It doesn't need to have all these fancy bits. Just play the game. It's fine. So I think sometimes people will just, think, well, I'm going to get this game on Kickstarter, so it's got to have all these fancy pieces, and it needs to be amazing, so I feel like I got my money out of it. I have the fancy Goo Gong. It would probably play just fine if I had the non-fancy Goo Gong, and I don't really feel like I would be missing out on anything. So I could have probably waited till that came to the store, but I got I bought into the hype, which is, I think, the main thing that people get sucked into on Kickstarter is the hype. Like, one game that's coming to mind, for example, is Hate. I've seen one yeah. one picture on all the Facebook groups of people actually playing that game. The other pi- pictures are, hey, look at these 52 boxes that I have of this hate game. I know. Yeah. This box is the size of a small child. Look, 
It's it's nuts, man. I yeah, I'm just I'm irritated with the whole Kickstarter thing. I may back some stuff, but it's got to be super special if I do. Yeah, I'm with you. And the Lorenzo thing, like three thoughts popped in my head right off the bat. One, like cool mini, you didn't even develop this game, so like how are you able to put it in Kickstarter when like <laughs> you're taking a game that in huge letters says Cranio on it, <laughs> right. And on small letters says cool mini or not. <laughs> And then, and then I was like, oh, that's cool. They're going to do a, another version of Lorenzo. And their trailer is going to be like, look at this curse word in game. It's full of hate. It's Lorenzo El Magnifico. <laughs> we've, I don't know. we've replaced nobles with cannibals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, Kickstarter wears me out a little bit. It's not going anywhere, though. It's a cash cow. Because it well, it, f- it feeds off of that like whole FOMO thing too. Like, right, yeah. Oh man, I don't want to miss out on these special holographic suburbia tiles, so I better back back this, you know. So yeah, and and no board game. I don't care. No board game is worth a hundred bucks, especially not suburbia when I can go to a game store and get it for fifty. Like, yeah, that's, that's fair. That's crazy, man. If the video reviews slow down um, after this episode, it's because we've never really had this kind of hot takes on our show before. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Our emails might not get answered like as well maybe after this. I don't know. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> All right. So just just recap. Um, Dr. Finn and Japanime Games, we love their Kickstarters. They're such good ones. All of theirs. That was not on our list. Yeah. Well, again, it's not not every company. Again, I think Dr. Finn's using it the way that he should. He, yeah, he's I think he's one right. of the, the people who is actually benefiting from Kickstarter. It's the big dogs, and everybody knows who they are. I think Jamie Stegmeyer was the exact touchstone of what you should do on Kickstarter. He started and established a company, and now he's moved away from it. Right. You know, I mean, like, and he he's thoroughly blogged why his journey was the way it was. You should go check it out. Um, it's, I mean, he makes all the sense in the world when he talks about it. So um, I think Kickstarter is perfectly a good place to be. A perfectly good forum and platform to to get your products out there, but like honestly, there's just some some use of it that I'm just like, really. And then I see that it gets like nine trillion dollars of backing, and I'm like, okay, cool. So whatever. Um, Kickstarter abuse, I guess, is our our number two point for each of us. Um, so Jason, this is one that's not going to be very popular. Either. This is going to be kind of a hot take, but this is just me, I guess, and how I game. And I guess maybe you probably can identify with it too. Because we've got to keep playing different stuff to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of the world to do a podcast. I I used to really think legacy games were a cool idea that you're going to build connections and bond with people over the course of 10 games with them. But I have such a hard time getting t- the 10 same people over to play a game, much less the same game 10 times in a reasonable amount of time, that I have three legacy games right now sitting on my shelf that are like between a third and two thirds played. And I have no idea where I'm at with them right now because it's been so long since I played them. Like I just, I have to go through and like try and relearn the rules and try and refigure out what did we scratch off and what did we put out and stuff. And just I don't know the whole legacy game thing. It sure did come in like pretty pretty fierce. I think it slowed down a little maybe, but I, that's something that if it stopped immediately, I wouldn't be any worse off at all. I wouldn't be sad. I wouldn't be upset because the whole legacy thing. It's just I can't do it. I can't keep up with it. And that's. I mean, a big part of the reason why I got rid of Gloomhaven is because I'm not that into legacy games, and that was another one to have. Um, Charterstone's a game that I really enjoy. It has all the right it hits all the right notes for me, but it's just I don't have the the ability to like even sort through the boxes and be like who was green again, um, and try and figure out you know like where we were at with stuff. And then like the pandemic season one, season two thing, like it's just it's tough if you don't play with the same group of people, like. If I play three games with you, skip you for two games, and then you come back in game five, that's not fair to you because you're like, wait, what? Why are there aliens? Spoiler. Um, so I don't know. Um, just just weird stuff, you know? So, I mean, Legacy Games, not a huge fan. Yeah, this almost made my list. I've only played one Legacy game, and that's Charterstone. And the whole time I was playing it, I was thinking, I should just play Viticulture or Scythe or Euphoria. It does the same stuff, and I can play a whole game and not have to ride it out for 12 games. And my other issue goes back to the reviews of these games. Every time somebody reviews these games, they don't show you anything because they don't want to spoil any of it. So how am I going to know what the game is or how it plays if you can't show me any of it? 
like I can only do so much research. I rely on reviewers sometimes to see some of it. And if no one's showing me it, the publisher, no one, you're kind of blind buying these games and I don't love that. So that's part of my issue with the legacy piece. Um, here you go. Precious years. Get ready for some spoilers. The King is evil. There's aliens, a hidden faction that appear later. And, um, everyone dies. <laughs> All I know is <laughs> in Charterstone we played like four games and every at the end of every game I was just excited that new pieces came out. That was the only piece that, that I thought was cool. Hey, we got some robots or hey, we got some kitties or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool cubes. <laughs> yeah. New cubes, yeah. Yeah. I mean it's it's yeah, it is what it is. People I mean it's fun opening boxes and stuff, but like I like I love Scythe. And like I'm just out of my depth with side now because it's like I have this eight eight episode campaign that I'm supposed to be working through, and like I don't have anybody who loves that game enough in my life to be like, yeah, heck yeah, I'll play eight games with you. Like I don't know, so like I'll probably end up just tearing things apart and just being like, all right, here are the modules, I'm going to use them, you know. So I don't know, legacy games, they could go away tomorrow, and I wouldn't be any the worse off. Right. Yep. I agree. All right. So you guys can probably guess what. The thing that I want to go away more than anything in the world is. And no, it's not Nobles. Jason at BoardGameMechanics.com. <laughs> uh, it would be minis. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I can't even express my dislike toward minis enough. I know, I know people like minis in games. I understand that people like the little toy element of the game moving stuff around. But what's the point? Like, honestly, what is the point of the stupid little plastic pieces? Give me a cube. Give me a little sorry pawn. Who cares? I'm just moving it around to play the game. It's mechanisms. It's not about the toy. If I wanted to play with toys, I'll go buy some G.I. Joes or a bucket of army men. I don't understand. So please, for the love of all things that are holy, stop putting minis in games, especially Euro games. Cheeses me off. All right, I'm done. Jason at BG McCann. I said that wrong. Um, Yeah, I'm sure uh, we're going to hear from Picorni on this one. (laughs) Um, I don't mind minis in games if it adds to the game, but if your game's relying on minis to be sold and have people like it, then it's a problem. Like, that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. Like, if your game would be okay if you had yellow and black and red and green cubes in it instead of aliens, zombies, and whatever, then, like, that's fine. But, like, there's just some games that have come out that are incredibly popular that I'm like, okay... If it weren't pretty, would people play it? You know, I mean, like, and I'm not positive that the answer is yes. Um, there are some where the answer is yes, and those games are perfectly fine. The other thing, too, is I think a good miniature can add to a certain thematic game, and that's fine. It's just I don't think a game should have to rely on it. That's where I'll agree with you, Jason. Yeah, and I guess that's probably a better a better definition of what I was trying to say. I, I don't like minis, period. But, yes, if you're just basically doing a Kickstarter – that's a board and 3,000 minis and there's no game there, that's a problem. But games like Cyclades or Blood Rage that use minis for a purpose, like you can use those minis and that's cool because it's that kind of game where you're moving little dudes around and fighting other dudes. But there are games that don't need that. Like I have the copy of Snowdonia that I just got in a trade. It has little plastic dudes in it. And all it is is it's mo- oh, moving around the geez, board. Jason. Why does it have plastic dudes? Ooh. <sighs> Melt it down, but I'm just gonna start using a cube. I mean, like I don't know. There, like off the top of my head, Wasteland Express Delivery Service has little like cars in it, and those cars make the game more fun. And that's I think a good use of minis. But like then I think about I don't know. Like hey, this game's basically checkers, but instead of it being checkers, it's got actual dudes or whatever. Like I don't know. Like, whatever simple game mechanic is out there, and then you just have to rely on the minis to make it okay. Like, that, that's, um, yeah, whatever. I mean, and if you're into minis, you're into minis. That's cool. Like, but just, you're not into games. You're into, like, minis that look cool and that you want to paint. And that's fine. That's a different hobby, you know? Right, yeah, so, yeah, I agree. And, and we're just not into that. So, yep. I'm not into it either. I've painted one of my games. I spent 40 hours painting it, and now I never play it. So, I mean, like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. If I ever paint a game, I'm going to use the, uh, army painter system where you basically spray paint everything and then slap some paint over the top of it. So, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, minis, I know people love it. I know absolutely people love minis and they can't add to a game, but
but I'm with you, Jason. I'll stand with you that the overuse of minis or reliance of minis to sell games is woof. Right. And going back to your first point, I don't want to shame people who are into minis because, like, like I said earlier, Picorni. He loves playing games of minis, and that's fine. That's cool. I know they're not for me. You can play them. I just am over them. It's just well, my pet peeve. That's why this list was called Things We Won't Miss. Like, yeah, these right, are things correct. that we wouldn't care about. Like, I mean, like, I don't know. And we're not saying that these should be the things that everyone's going to miss if they went away but like, or wouldn't miss, but I don't know. Um, whatever gets us playing more Happy Pigs, really, at the end of the day, <laughs> is what it comes down to. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's really all we're looking for is more happy pig game time yeah well anyway <laughs> i uh i i guess i'm glad it's your week to edit jason because you've got more guts than i do like i'd probably be editing out like all this like what are your things you don't like jason and it would be edited down to i don't like <laughs> stuff that is mean <laughs> me either jason well good episode yeah i'm gonna leave it i don't care like I know it's you our are. opinions. We should be able to express our opinions because that's the beauty of what a podcast is. Yep. Well, let's. I mean, just in reviewing here, uh, I my three were game shaming, so elitism in gaming. Like, let people play the games they want to play, and it's cool. Um, you don't have to be all judgy about it. Kickstarter abuse. We both had that one where it's like, if you're not kickstarting something, if you're capitalizing on fear of missing out, I don't know. That's those are my things, I guess. Um, and then my last one was, uh, legacy games and Jason, I guess I want to, I, I just want to make sure that like, like I'm clear on my points. Like if you like those things, cool. Good on you. Uh, those are the things I'm not into. Yeah. And my three are reviewers, not getting rid of reviewers, but basically forming opinions on your own, maybe using reviews as a guide, not to shape your opinions. My second one is Kickstarter abuse. You talked about that as well using Kickstarter for what its main purpose is, not to exploit the system. And my third one is minis. If you like minis games, that's great. But I don't, and that's where we'll leave it. So those are my three. Hey, it was just fun doing this podcast with you, Jason. Um, <laughs> yeah, I may get some hate mail. That's fine. It's, it's, it's all good. I mean, whatever. I mean, uh, I think I'm going to get it too. <laughs> People love their Kickstarter, they love their minis, they love their legacy games, but I mean, they aren't our thing, so whatever. Right, yeah, and it, if if it was things you should get rid of, as in our listeners, then I don't know what I would say to that, because I don't know what you should get rid of in your games, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you guys can say, get rid of games that have multi-use cards in them. I love that. Get rid of cards that have worker placement. Get rid of games that have wooden cubes. I mean, that's your list. That's cool. Um, and I won't, and I won't do anything nasty about it. I'll let you be. So with that said, please don't chuck your kingdom death monster mini wrapped in a hate mail note through Jason's front window. (laughs) Yeah, please don't. Please. I beg you don't. I don't, I don't want, he has children and I don't want the minis in my house. I just said, I don't like minis. So please don't. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. (laughs) I I think I've said enough to get myself in trouble a lot. So I'm going to shut up. Yeah, me too. There's a good joke in there somewhere, but I'm just going to let it sit there. (laughs) Well, I think we're back to being fun, I guess. Yeah. On this hate-filled, mean episode. (laughs) This probably was like our meanest episode ever, I think. Probably, but I mean, like, I don't know. Doesn't mean we didn't think it before that. That's true. That is true. Uh, all right. Well, this this podcast not brought to you by Cool Mini Kickstarter uh, <laughs> or Legacy Games, Stonemaier Games, uh, uh. Z Man Games. Uh, who else did we probably totally isolate ourselves from? It's only brought to you by Steve Finn and Japanime. That's it. <laughs> who use Kickstarter the right way? Yep. Uh. And old games <laughs> that. People still play, and I don't care. It's fine. You can play old games. Yep. And it's not brought to you by the Dice Tower or Tom Vassell or Rado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was the hot take, man. I'm like, whoa. We we like Rado, bud. What are you I doing? I do. I love Rado. I'm just... That's proving my point. Yeah. Like, and, I, and I actually do like the Dice Tower guys for the most yeah, part. Yeah, me too. But like... Yeah, I mean... Uh, but yeah. All right. Yeah, your point was just don't let them run right. anything. That's yeah, I, that's, that's I watch them all the time. Yep. Yeah, that, that's beside the point. Yep, and uh, and I'll tell you what that 
that undead Viking, he sure is outspoken. Just kidding. He's like my favorite <laughs> meek and mild mannered yeah. reviewer that I've ever watched. He really is. He's super nice. <laughs> yeah, he's the coolest guy, man, for sure. So, all right. Well, this show brought to you by Undead Viking and Steve Finn and Japan Anime Games. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Wooden Cubes, maker of Wooden Cubes. <laughs> and Nobles. <laughs> Noble Wooden Cubes. <laughs> All right, this has been stupid enough, probably. I'm, I'm going to say this has been cool. Keep gaming. Yeah,